So today we're gonna to teach you how to find success in pre-construction real estate investing with one of the smartest minds on the planet, Mr. Jazz Takar, good friend of the Prime team. The RIC team and Prime collaborate all the time, but this guy has done thousands of reps in the space. He'll expose you on how to select the right projects. They say no to a lot of them, but what makes them say yes? He introduces different concepts you may not be aware of around HST implications and tax implications to pre-construction investing, how to leverage deposit structures the right way and how to find cash flowing opportunities in pre-construction. It was an eye-opening episode. He really digs in and gives some tangible advice. So I know you're gonna get so much out of this. All we ask is that you go follow those guys, you comment, you subscribe, and you let us know what you want. We're having so much fun introducing you to our world. We have some of the best partners on the planet and a little bit of housekeeping. Our next episode coming up in January, 2021, we have none other than the man himself, Mr. Scott McGilvery from the hit TV show, Income Property. Again, another close friend of Prime and a partner, and he's gonna be kicking off next year's season. So we're having a blast. If you wanna join our text community. So we'll do a tiny bit of housekeeping that we'll jump right into it. I know Jazz is on the line, so I wanna get him on ASAP. I wanna make the most of your time. So primarily for those that don't know who we are, I'm Justin Conoco, one of the owners of Prime Real Estate with my beautiful wife. Prime Real Estate is a real estate brokerage, operates in London, Ontario, but covers, like I said, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Woodstock, and Sarnia. I'm not gonna sell you anything. I'm not gonna sell you any coaching. I'm not gonna tell you to buy anything. We're just gonna share everything that we have access to to make you better at whatever you would like to do in your life. If you're looking to purchase real estate, you know, whether for your own primary residence, whether you're looking to get in the investment market, the reason we do the mastermind is it actually makes us better. So when I do podcasts, I'm being a little bit selfish that I'm sharpening my skill set and I'm getting better for what I do and growing, but ultimately it's the community that grows. And Jazz was actually the very first guest we ever had at the Prime Mastermind, what, over a year ago now. We had brought him down to London. He came on with one of the top land developers in North America. We jammed at my old workplace and it really started off something that Lindsay and I are very passionate about. Lindsay's one of the team members here at Prime. She actually was an investor. I poached her from another employment place, told her to get her license, and she is a designer investor herself, super passionate about the business. Um, but the format of the show is really, we just give you an insight into somebody that had success in real estate recently. We'll go over the market update as to what's happening in our territory so you can be prepared to make decisions in whatever aspect you want to make them. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to bring on jazz, and we're going to dig into a specific topic. So I won't Go into that quite yet. I'll just get into the market stats because everybody wants to know what's happening in the real estate market. I have conversations every single day with people texting me. And I had one yesterday from a guest I had on last week. And he was like, hey, is you know the London market taking a beating? And I was like, well, like, are sellers taking a beating like a good way or a bad way? Like, what do you mean by that? Right. And he was very surprised that I said that. And he's like, well, how's the market doing amid everything else? Because he's in the GTA area. And I said, What's happening is anytime something happens in the market, it trickles down and then stays in a pocket where the affordability and the economics make it such that it's a competitive market. And that's what we're dealing with right now. Like if I'm looking at the benchmark price in London, I think we're $545,000, which is actually up 118% from five years ago, 28% up from last year. But it's everything that I've been saying. And Jasmine, and I'll dig into this because I also recently had a conversation with somebody in the GTA market where I said, the GTA market right now, you know, it's on sale just because of the fact that there's a few mitigating factors that people aren't thinking five years ahead, right? People in real estate tend to think about right now and they're all they're thinking about is COVIDs and lockdowns and stuff like that. So they may be selling their condos, leaving the city, but don't be surprised if they're priced out when they want to come back because immigration is still on point. You know, when the world does open up and entertainment, sports and everything gets going again, Toronto is still Toronto. It's still a very desirable place to live. And if you watch the stats over 10, 20, 30 years, they're very different than six months at a time. We'll get into that a little bit when I get jazz on. London's kind of the same thing, right? People, you know, I remember, what was it, a year and a half ago, anything over 700, people were sweating it. Builders were worried. They were starting to sell off lots. Product just wasn't moving. Like there was an undertone in the real estate industry that if you had anything under 600, you were good. If you were over that, you know, I remember last December, November-ish, things were just not moving. And there was really some concern there. Now, literally, I just sold a property that people told me they thought was worth 1.1 for 1.3. Things that, you know, people here think are undervalued. People from out of town are coming in and they're saying that thing would be worth two and a half million. I'll pay 1.5 for that, right? So the perspective is changing. Same with our multifamily and our investment properties. 
So we've had a lot of investment properties we've sold off market. We've done a lot of deals on market where perception wise, the market would look at it and say, well, that income doesn't justify that price. I don't want to buy it, but the market justifies the price and the income is well underperforming. So as our investors are buying these properties and then bringing them up to par, all of a sudden they're popping off new sale prices or reappraised values because the market is there. And appraisers, like we had Bob Lyons on, what, two months ago, appraisers are very conservative and they need to have a history or data set to warrant the appraised values and the appraised values are rolling in. So what I would say is, because Jazzy's on the podcast, we're going to talk about this, you know, I think you know, if I was Warren Buffett, I'd be buying up every condo I possibly could in Toronto right now. And then if I was operating in the London market, I'd just be a little bit more diligent about how I was looking at opportunities. I'd rely more on my team, the creativeness of how do you take something that, you know, is a lump of coal and turn it into a diamond. We're working on what, five properties that we sent out to the membership last week that are on the market. These are properties that have been in the market for months. Adnan sitting across from me, went through them. There's one that's you know, a fourplex that could potentially be a sixplex. There's, there's so many things you just got to put in the work. And a lot of the reason why some people can't find deals is they're just waiting for something that cash flows a thousand dollars a month, or they're just waiting for that unicorn. Meanwhile, other people are pulling the trigger on getting deals done and it's just rolling from there. So I'm going to bring on Jazzy Fizzle. I'm going to kick off Lindsay Give me one second here. And we're going to get right into it. Ah, there he is. Look at that. See, he's all in on Zoom. He knows how to turn his camera on. I didn't even have to do anything. <laughs> how you doing, Justin? Good. What is up, my man? Uh, you know, a lot is going on here. It's getting uh, a little colder here in Toronto, but uh, we had uh, a, a two, almost two weeks of like 15, 16 degree weather. I don't, I'm not sure how was it in, in, in London, but uh, loving life over here, my man. How's everything over there? Good, man. Same thing. A little gray outside right now, but we had the same thing. You know, beautiful sunshine weather, and then we had a snow squall out of nowhere, and now it's six degrees again. And I mean, we're Canadian for a reason, right? It gives us the ability to appreciate the good and the bad. Big, big shout out to Lindsay, and congratulations not only to her, but to her parents. I overheard uh, kind of the end of that uh, negotiation, and so uh, big congratulations to you, Lindsay. Yeah. And I mean, you were up in Grand Bend in the summertime. Remember I caught up with you then? What, what do you think about the lakefront properties? Gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, I, I, I probably, the last time I went there was over a decade ago. So obviously it was different. Um, and, and thanks for dropping by. Um, give me kind of a quick rundown. Obviously you're the man to talk to in that area. Um, but uh, just a beautiful, beautiful place. The kids loved it. We were there for uh, four, four days. My, my family was actually there for eight days. Uh, but we were really busy at that time. And so I, I hopped over for four days, just a gorgeous spot, my man. And I think that's what we're looking at right now is, you know, the world and, and people appreciating what they have, right? I think, you know, if COVID and I'll bring it right up front has taught us anything is to appreciate what you do have, right? Appreciate what, you know, the family that you have, the people around you, the communities and pour into those communities. The way you and I look at life, I know that we look at everything as a positive, even when something doesn't go the way it's necessarily supposed to, well, that's an opportunity, right? So, you know, finding ways to operate and discover new opportunities like Grand Bend, for example, which has been in your backyard for the last 10 years and you've been to twice, you know, I think it gives people a newfound appreciation for life, right? It's all, you know, I just posted something just before I got on here, I posted something on Instagram, just talking about that. It's all about perspective. Um, you know, we see a storm coming, um, but if you, you can look at it differently, right? Maybe it's going to open up a new path for you. Um, maybe it's like during COVID right now, it really is, in my opinion, a matter of, hey, like, yeah, you can talk about all the stuff that you're not able to do, but what about the stuff that you are able to do now? So maybe spend a little bit more time with your family. Maybe spend some time on a new side hustle. Um, maybe do some more research. Like there's just so much that we can be grateful about. Um, and you know, I, we talk on a regular basis and look, the more grateful that you are of what you have, a funny thing starts to happen like attracts like, and that the universe, and not to get so philosophical on a Saturday morning, but the universe starts to make things happen that is in line with where your fo what, what your brain is focusing on. And so if there's anything that I hope I get across, and I know we're going to be speaking a lot about uh, pre-construction investment strategies and, in, and, and investing in general, but wow, if you can just wake up in the morning and be grateful for what you have, you will be surprised about 
all the opportunities you'll get in front of because it's not a matter of looking for opportunities. They're already all over the place. It's a matter of aligning yourself so you can get in front of those opportunities. Yeah, and to be frank with you, I mean, you and I are cut from the same plot this way where I'm not even really interviewing you. I just want to have a conversation, sure. but I do want to give people practical takeaways. So everybody that's watching, you know, grab a pen, grab a paper, because you're getting access to information in a guy like Jazz that has seen literally thousands and thousands of deals and goes through a lot of the analysis of, of how to vet a deal, right? We'll get into actually a project that we've been working on collaboratively between the RAC team and Prime give people a glimmer and an insight into what that looks like later on as to how do you select a project? How do you decide where you're going to put your money? Because, you know, we all work very, very hard for our money and we all have different risk tolerances. But, you know, when you go back to what you were saying about just putting in the work and understanding that in the long run by hook or by crook, you're going to make it happen. Give me an idea of, of how jazz's mind works, right? Give our audience a little bit of background. You're from Rexdale area, like you're doing your podcast is absolutely incredible. You're you know, you. interviewing people that are inspiring and you're finding what you're doing, what we're doing here, where you're finding ways of translating that to your audience and layering. At the same time, you operate the RAC team, which is number one Royal LePage team in Canada. How did you actually get to that point amidst challenges throughout your life? Look, I, I mean, I, I, as you mentioned, I was born in the, the north part of Toronto in Rexdale in an area that... Um, there's not a lot of people to look up to. There's not a lot of inspiring stories, right? I'm very, very blessed um, to be born in the family that I was. My, my father was a, a taxi driver his whole life. Uh, my mother was a factory worker her whole life. And I had two older brothers. And so even my two older brothers, it was, it was interesting because one still till this day has a very business mindset, wants to invest. The other is just happy with what he has on a regular basis. Like, I have a feeling in a couple of hours, he's just going to put on a podcast and start cutting everyone's grass in the area that, that, that he lives in, because for them, for him, that's what happiness is. Um, for me though, you know, going through school and high school, I just didn't learn that way, Justin. I, 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 I had a hard time sitting in class. Right. Um, and so for me, I wanted to, you can't really like right behind me here, there's hundreds and hundreds of books around me. Um, and now I, you know, spend a lot of my time listening to audiobooks and, and podcasts. But it, for me, I was inspired by, by other leaders and business leaders, guys and gals that have already done what I wanted to do, which one part was investing in real estate. But even before that, I, I loved the sales and service industry. I loved meeting with people you know, at the age of 12, I had my first paper route. I learned that if I learned uh, uh, that my friends in the area never really wanted to even make a phone call to ask for a paper route. So I started brokering out routes to my friends and taking a little cut at a young age. I learned business kind of right from the streets in that sense. And I got into shoe sales and in, in the banking industry and then car sales. And then I've now been doing real estate for 15 years, myself and my business partner, Simos. Um, I still am the better looking business partner and you guys who know us, you guys can leave a comment and let us know if it's myself or Simos, but uh, him and I have been doing this now for 15 years. We have 39 real estate agents that cover the greater Toronto area, really essentially from Hamilton over to Durham, Newmarket to the lake. We've got 11 support staff, which include a uh, a really cool media squad. We produce approximately 15 to 20 pieces of content daily. Um, I heard you speak earlier about giving away all the education up front and then allowing, you know, the audience here, your huge, huge network at Prime, allowing people to make their own informed decision, right? Like, I, I know you go through it, uh, Justin, where, where, look, I mean, we're, we're handling millions upon millions of dollars every single year and and some people are very you know like they're very green when it comes to investing in real estate and i want to make sure i sleep well at night and so the way that i do that is look here's all the information up front this way you can make a quality decision yourself mr and mrs client let us just be essentially the voice um, a, a, a place where you can get information um, and that's made it easy for us and that's how we've kind of grown over the last 15 years and to touch on that, I mean, the best, best feeling conversations you and I both have with our clients is when we tell them not to do something. Like quite often, the, the hardest thing in our lives, right, is dealing with somebody 
that thinks we're just trying to sell them. Say, oh, you're just a real estate agent, right? And I always laugh. I, I kind of tell people I'm not, right? Truthfully, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just, and this is what I happen to do. This happens to be my skill set. But I also like fishing and jujitsu and photography and videos and podcasts. Like we've created a life integration around what we do. Our job is a vehicle to create relationships, but the depth of relationships is what really creates wealth, both from personal satisfaction. Like when I teach somebody to do something, I have a competitor coming in here on Monday who wants to ask me about branding a new build site. And I'm happy to share with her. She didn't work with me. I don't think we're not really hiring right now. We've got some new team members coming on and apprentices and whatnot. But what do I get from that other than fulfillment that maybe she finds success in her life and passes it along to somebody else? You know, and I think one of the, the practical karma, takeaway right? I want, you, sorry, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, I was saying, and, and karma plays a part. Like think about all what you have, like what you have in your life now, right? Like the beautiful office space, the, the team, like you're, you're, like I, I know, and I'll even speak for you, man. I know you're standing on the shoulders of giants over there, right? Like, I mean, you're able to see further for because of it. And, and that all has all come into your life. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, buddy, but it's because of that time that you put in just giving away what, you know, giving away information to what people would say. Some would say that these are your competitors. Some would say you and I are competitors. Once every two weeks, we're on a phone call just sharing what's worked well in our businesses, in our personal life. Like, that's not that that's not uh, uh, worrying about competition. That's collaboration at its best. Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, I still remember the first phone call that you made to me where you were telling me about, you know, working together and going to these events. And I was like, who's this guy? Like, it was just, <laughs> yeah, I literally, I think I said, no, Shannon's the smarter one than me. And then she's like, call Jazz back. Go to that event. It's phenomenal. And I mean, we're brothers now, but you know, I want to give people that practical takeaway. I'm sorry to cut you off really, but I wanted to tell the audience, grab your pens and let's practical tip one, how do you create integration in your life? And you know, we're going to talk about the pre-construction stuff in a second, but you know, how do you integrate the passion for the podcast, your real estate investing to your job, to your family, and still find joy in all of those things? Cause I think that's super important. Well, look, I mean, um, uh, I'm a hard worker. I work a lot. Um, I go six days a week, essentially. Um, I'm, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, two little boys. Um, and I'm still trying to figure that part out, right? Like, I'm not perfect. I'm trying to hack away at it every week. And so there might there, there's some Fridays where I, I, I get out of the office earlier just to get home uh, to the kids with the podcast and all. Look, I love now having conversations with people that have done what I wanted to do, as I mentioned that earlier. And what I'm able to do now is record it like you are, and we're recording this and put it out to the world and let, let people be a fly on the wall with conversations that we're having. And so the podcast for me, which we started two years ago, really was a massive game changer because I'm learning I'm asking questions. I'm very curious. Like growing up, Curious George was my favorite book of all time. Like I loved that little monkey running around and getting in trouble and, and oh, he's trying to find out. Like he's, him just being curious, me being very curious is what started this podcast. I was like, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn. And while I'm learning, I'm going to help others uh, uh, allow them essentially, sorry, to be a fly on the wall. And that's why that that's what that's what started the podcast and that's what's actually taken it to new heights because I get feedback now on a regular basis, Justin, like, can you get this person on? Can you get this person on? And we want to hear more real stories. Like I think one of the most listened to episodes of ours was done about two years ago with Sue, Mur uh, Sue Murphy. She might even be on here for all I know. Mm -hmm. um, I know, I know we both know her really well. She went from zero to 11 properties in 11 to 12 month period. Right. I mean, that's really cool. Like sh how how she did it. What did she do uh, uh, in terms of joint ventures and financing? Um, and so now allowing others others to be a fly in the wall has really grown my business. So think about that. Right. Like for the investors or the people that want to get into real estate on this podcast, 11 properties that, you know, even call it an average of three hundred thousand dollars of property. You can think about what her net worth is based on her asset acquisition. Right. And I think that's where you and I, I always think about, you know, if you and I were kids running around in that curious George mode, what havoc we would cause, but I know you and I would do this if there wasn't a single person on here, right? Because again, we're developing our skill set, we're learning, we're building, and we get so much value from every single one of these that we shoot. So, you know, I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for the audience's time, the community. There's so many people here I learn stuff from. 
I'm going to hop us right into the pre-construction conversation. Um, and literally, you know, I, I just want to dig into, you know, maybe some myths around pre-construction first, right? We'll talk about your market in a second, but let's jump into, you know, what is pre-construction and give me some of the most, you know, prolific myths around pre-construction purchasing that you come across on a daily basis. Yeah. So first and foremost, let me just give a, a, a quick little background where all this data is coming from. So as, as you mentioned earlier, Justin, like we've been doing this for 15 years, but pre-construction for us has been for, we've been doing that and heavily focused on that for the last say eight years here in the GTA. And so in the last eight years, we've done approximately 200 units with investors every single year. So, and I think the number works out to be, I think it's like 542 units that we've helped investors with. So now we have a lot of data, obviously. Essentially with the pre-construction, your, 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 your agreement price, okay, so which is today's price, you're locking that in at today's value for something that's going to be built and delivered to you really about three and a half to four years. That's in the greater Toronto area and some other areas. And if it's low rise or high rise could be done a little quicker. But in, in, in the GTA, we focus on more on high rise because that's what you're able to build here. And so builders are actually seeing much larger returns with building more units, obviously. And so your agreement price is a lot lower than what your delivery date price is going to be in a three and a half to four year period. You asked about the myths. I think the, the biggest myth that I come across is that in the greater Toronto area, you're not able to find something that's cash flowing or at least even cash flow neutral, which is just, which is just not true. Because the building takes that three and a half to four years to build, it, you, the rents have always caught up. And so for, the, for that eight year period, your rental income always has covered your expenses, like your mortgage payment, your maintenance fee, your property taxes, as well as an insurance that's needed um, as, a, a, as a landlord as well. And so I think the biggest myth that we come across, Justin, is the fact that uh, uh, you, you're not able to find a, a, a new build where the rental income covers the expenses. A lot of people also just don't know how money is made and I know we're going to dive into that for sure, but how money is actually made with pre-construction. So you have the passive appreciation from agreement price to delivery date price. But what you also, like I have Andre Matos, a client of ours that has done this approximately, I think it's about 11 times now in the last three and a half, four years. And what he's always done is that once it gets built, what he does, he closes on it. He closes on the property and a week later, he goes to the bank and gets, I, he either does a refinance on the mortgage or what we usually advise is to get a home equity line of credit. He gets a home equity line of credit. And so now essentially he owns this condo with zero down, with none of his own money. And all he did was write some deposit checks throughout that time of three and a half to four years. And I mean, that's something that people they are looking at, again, going back to what I said earlier, they're just looking at today's price, right? Like we're selling for Domus, the building that I'm in, this awesome office right now, we're selling a product in Fort Stanley right now, new, new construction homes back in onto a ravine. And those homes, when we had them pre pre launch, like they weren't even on MLS yet, we had them at, I think a $20,000 discount. So anybody that signed on the paper understood, well, I'm buying these now, like the foundations aren't even in, they haven't even really finished servicing. Once they start doing the foundations and the prices are already up 25, by the time they're actually built next summer, they're going to be up another 25, 50,000 maybe. So the people that wait until they're like, well, I want to see the model. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Totally cool. Don't buy now. That's okay. But the people that are like, no, I want new construction because I want to get the equity jump in investing in a neighborhood that's a little dusty and dirty while they're building construction. Well, they feel a lot better when they go to the bank, pull the mortgage and the bank sends an appraiser and says, well, your property is worth a lot more now than it was when you bought it, which is vastly different from the resale market where the resale market is what's today's value you're buying it this is what it's worth today right when you're you're looking at doing furs and investing and refinancing that's a different strategy you're still you know you're basing on future value let me ask you that question because i know it's a burning question for people that are here is how can you guarantee future value well look i mean you want to make sure you're looking at location right and so to me the number one 
the number one uh, 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 box that needs to be checked off in part of due diligence is location first and foremost, because who is going to be renting from there from an investors? And I think, you know, most of our audience today is investors. And so as an investor, just like if you're a business owner, you're thinking, who's going to be my customers? And so in this case, we're looking at tenants. Who's going to want to live here? Why are they wanting to live here? And that's going to be based on location. And so if you look at, when you look at location, now you can start to determine you can start to determine what the future value is going to be. We're very ultra, ultra conservative. So, for example, in the greater Toronto area, if you look at the last five years alone, okay, and we can go a lot bigger sample sizes, but let's just stick with five years for a sec. In the last five years, we've seen a 50% increase on, on pricing on just condos alone. So just high-rise condos alone. That's 10% year-over-year year increase that we've seen on condos. What we do when we work our performance, we go ultra-conservative and use, for example, a 5% increase year-over-year. Year. And so when you talk about future values, you just need to look back at what ha how has the market performed. So I actually like to take it out a little bit further, and I go from five years and I go to 40 years. So for the last 40 years now, we've seen a 7.3 year over year increase on pre-con. And you're still running it under that, right? Like I'll throw the elephant in the room that people are just talking about on a daily basis. And I addressed it at the beginning of the episode where people are like, well, more COVID and Toronto prices are dropping and everybody's losing a ton of money. I mean, you just took care of my sister on a deal where she made it a phenomenal acquisition. You guys got it for an unreal price for her. So thank you. Your team crushed that. We and then, you know, she had a condo in Liberty Village and I had a discussion with her and, you know, she sold it for a great price. Could she have gotten more if she waited, you know, down the road a little bit? Yeah, maybe. But she also killed it on the buy side. So there's always an upside. And I think that's a misconception that the general public has because they're not doing webinars like this and getting the inside track into how to find success in real estate is... It, it all nets out and it just depends on what the opportunity cost is of what you're looking to accomplish. Right. And I said earlier on, you know, who's your demographic? What are the, what are the intangibles that irregardless of the, the overall market factors are not going to change, you know, the day to day, you know, where is it a no brainer that you're going to want to open your office, that you're going to want to live, that the restaurateurs, that if this guy shuts down, somebody else is going to come in and take his spot. You know, we have a couple of friends that own restaurants downtown their numbers are solid. We were just talking to them about it because they're like, yeah, tons of people still live downtown. They still need to eat, right? So regardless of what the media is shoving down their throat, they're still going to have to do the things that they have to do. So number one, everybody write that down. Location is absolutely key when you're selecting a site or a pre-construction opportunity. What are some and, options? Go ahead. And, and, and sorry, Justin, like just you know, to add on to what you're saying, and, and I think you mentioned it earlier as well before I came on, like you have to look at real estate through the lens of a long-term investment. In my opinion, the investors, the thousands upon inve thousands of investors that we've helped, how they win is that they look at it through a minimum of a 10-year window. So when you're looking at something with 10 years and some, and, and, and when, when a pandemic happens, like we just, we're going through right now and, and in Toronto, we're as of Monday, we're going in, into another lockdown. Yep. The borders, like the, the, the borders are shut. We're not having the immigration come in to the GTA that we're used to seeing. So pre COVID, we were looking at approximately 250,000 people just into the greater Toronto area year after year. So half of London. Literally yeah. half of London every year. Half of London's full population, right? I mean, yeah. we have 250,000 people coming. The, uh, Immigration Canada just came out with the numbers uh, uh, two weeks ago. So their forecast now, so pre-COVID, in 10 years, it was going to be 2.5 million, 250,000 year over year. The new numbers is at 3.3 million people into the greater Toronto area in the next 10 years. This is just a blip. Right. And so I understand. I understand when people say, oh, my God, the values uh, uh, for rents have gone down in, in downtown Toronto. Yeah, they have. Let's look at why, though. A, first and foremost, the borders are closed. We're not we have no immigrants coming in. We don't have the students that we've had for years upon years that coming into the downtown core. Number two is that Airbnb, the short term rental market, because they weren't allowed to rent out their units and their homes in the downtown area, came onto the long term market. So now you just have 
more supply, you don't have the demand that we had coming in for, because of the immigrants and, and, and the students. And so this is just a little blip. So I, I get a call at least, at least once a day with somebody wanting to sell their condo or their home in downtown Toronto. I'm like, guys, this is not the time to sell. In fact, values have dipped a little bit. This is the time to hold on. Just, just weather this storm. And look, I mean, the news of this vaccine at 90% effectiveness, you saw what that did to the stock market. You mm -hmm. saw that what that did to a lot of REITs um, in our country as well. Value started to shoot up. Consumer confidence is a very interesting, interesting term when it comes to economics, right? Like people are starting to get more confident now. There's a vaccine, you know, and, 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 and again, I do air quotes because I don't know. I'm not a health practitioner. I don't play one on the podcast either. But I, I think what you're able to, you, you, what we're seeing is that the, the strength in consumer confidence now is, okay, look, there's a vaccine coming around the corner. Borders are going to start to open up. There's actually some deals that you could scoop up in certain areas when values dip. That's when, you know, real estate just went on sale. Like if we were talking about, if we were speaking about a Canada goose jacket going on sale, people would run, they would take lunch off to, to go save a hundred bucks on a jacket. And I get it, more shoes or whatever it is, but real estate just went on sale in certain areas. Now is the time to, 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 to consider some of these compelling buying opportunities because you win in real estate, A, by holding on to it, but B, buying low, not selling low. Not selling ever if you don't have to. And first off, thank you for keeping me on track. I have such a hard time not going down a wormhole with you every time we can get into so many different topics. But, you know, you answered my question very effectively there where don't do what the crowd is doing, right? When the stock market was tanking and everybody was selling, yeah, you lose money if you sell, right? Nobody can time the stock market. No real estate agent can time the real estate market. They're a liar if they tell you that they can what you want people that are going to tell you how to succeed. Really social distance yourself from some agent or anybody who tells you that they have the crystal ball, right? It's it's greasy. Yeah. Everybody knows it. You can smell it on the people that need a deal out of you. You want to work with people that are just going to, again, tell you this the information and the experience and the skill set and connect you with the right people to give you the opportunities, which is what everybody wants. They, they want the inside track and they want something that I believe in so much that I would invest in myself to be an opportunity that maybe they would look at. We'll dig into that in a second. Um, but, you know, talking about running away from, you know, a market where everybody's running away from, Warren Buffett does the absolute opposite, right? And, you know, you look at opportunities and to me, everything's an opportunity. Actually, one of the biggest misnomers, I'd love for you to expand on this, um, in the real estate market is people think, oh, the real estate market's gonna crash, doesn't that suck? And I'm like, well, it just means our investors are gonna go crazy and buy everything on the market because they can get seven and nine cap rates and they don't have to put in a lot more effort to turn a five into a seven or a nine. So like in our business, it, it's always gonna be one or the other and things tend to balance out. But you know, do you think there's any misconceptions around that and when it comes yeah, look, to- I mean, we, we've been waiting for the real estate crash in the GTA for the, for, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. We've been waiting for it to crash for 15 years. We've seen slight dips, uh, blips in terms of, uh, uh, sorry, back in 2009 when, when the financial meltdown happened uh, in the States, we saw, you saw values drop for a, a six month period. Then they shot back up more than what we were seeing pre that 2008 period. And then even now, like at, during this lockdown, during the pandemic, the, the, the most recent stats we have are for October, okay? The November ones will be out in a couple of weeks, but a year over year increase, Justin, in the GTA of 13.1%. The average piece of real estate in the greater Toronto area, when you compare October, 2020 to October, 2019, it was 13.1% increase. That's not me making up a number. That's not a forecast. That's actually black and white numbers. Now, for somebody who's watching, you want to make sure that as what I just said and what I just spoke about, the media does a lot of this as well, where I'm speaking about the macro market in the greater Toronto area. That's a 75 kilometer radius. 
within the greater Toronto area, there's uh, probably um, close to 700 market uh, micro markets. Mm -hmm. And so where you're thinking about investing, and it's the same in London as well, and in the areas that you cover, Justin, you want to look at the micro market. So whoever you're working with, if it's not Justin, if it's not myself, it's not our teams, make sure that you get the statistics about the micro market that you're looking at. There's another uh, mutual friend of ours, Anna Scott, that just posted something and it was about another forecast that some, you know, big holding company made around Canadian real estate values going down, right? Just like CMHC forecasted and it never happened and they never redacted that statement. These people are saying, this is going to happen. And she asked, you know, what are your thoughts? And I said, it's a macro clickbait headline article on a micro problem, right? Because when I'm valuing somebody's house, like, you talk about how the market's done and, you know, look over the last five to 10 years in our market, even when it was at its most competitive, I've still seen tons of money and people leave money on the table because they just didn't deal with their sale or their purchase the right way, right? They overpriced because the market's so amazing. Anybody will pay anything. Then they have to do full reductions and they get an offer 150 under asking price. Or, you know, they just go with the cheapest agent who charges 3% who lists you at like, 30 grand under asking price. Don't worry, we'll get 150 over. And they don't, right? And that property should have sold for 840 and sold for 770. These are literally real properties that I know statistically yeah. should have sold for a lot more than they did. So you can still fail in a boom market. You can still succeed in a bus market. I think that the funny thing I was thinking about when you were saying about the, you know, that 13% increase in Toronto, was that in any news articles anywhere? No. Well, what? Look, I mean, if it bleeds, it leads, right? And so I think there's more of a, there's more of an interest in the media making sure that they get the, you know, you're speaking about the clickbait, for example. Um, they don't Let's really get Simos on. Let him jump on. Talk about yeah. this. <laughs> he loves clickbait stuff. He loves it, and he'll tear it apart. Um, in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, I, I want to also take it back to the pre-construction uh, strategy as well, Justin. Where there's so many other ways you also win when you win invest in a pre-construction, right? Because you kind of you slightly compared it to a resale, which is very important because I know the audience is looking at possibly other resale opportunities. One of the big advantages that I take, uh, what, what, one of the biggest benefits I take advantage of in a pre-construction strategy is the fact that you don't need to actually get a mortgage till it closes which allows me to get flexible with other possible investments I might want to look at, but also hey, look, I can take advantage of an assignment as well, because it's written and you got to make sure that, that this is written in your uh, agreement of purchase and sale, the ability to assign the ability to assign the contract just to another uh, purchaser, end user, or investor. So those are two other points I hope people are writing down. The, the, the biggest benefits to pre-construction condo investing is that you have the ability to be flexible because you don't need to get a mortgage. It hasn't closed yet. It doesn't show up on the radar. And so if you invest into a, pre, a, 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 a new build and you want to look at a multiplex at the same time, the, build, the, the, the lenders won't see that you're investing into a pre-con. So it doesn't tie up your ability from a leverage perspective. And then the second thing is, is, is the ability to assign a contract. We believe in buy and hold. Macro, a macro thesis on investing in real estate is buying and holding, but life happens, right? Things come up. And so that security blanket of an assignment clause is, is very important as well. So why would I assign a property, right? So if I bought in say phase one, of, let's call it a $50,000 discount, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden we're six months down the road and I'm like, I need that cash and don't want to close or I just don't want to own the property. Literally, I just want to assign the sale to somebody else. Do I call you back? And then do you sell it for me? Like, how do I do that without paying commissions and costs and HST? And like, we'll dig into the HST in a second, but you know, how do I do that when I haven't even closed on the property yet? Yeah, well, so, so as long as it's in the contract that you're allowed to assign, okay, you're, you're going to be able to essentially flip the paper to a new purchaser. Yes, you would call back. You don't have to use the same realtor that you, that you bought it with. It's probably advantageous for you to do that. They might have a buyer list or something like that. They might have, well, not only, the buyers, not only the buyer's list, Justin, that's definitely something that they'll have. But number two is that they know the project probably better than anyone else. So mm -hmm. they're going to be able to flip it to another investor. 
quite quickly. So we do about 30 to 40 assignments a year. It's not something that we like to do with our clients only because we want them to hold on to the property, right? However, again, it's A, used as a security blanket. What a lot of investors have used that assignment clause for in the last five years, they saw significant profit. So in that... In the last five years, a thousand units approximately, we've seen an increase from agreement price to delivery date price, a difference of about 110 to 120,000. I like to say 75 to 80,000 because I like to look like a rock star in that at that time of delivery, uh, at the time of the assignment. But look, man, it's hard. Not, it's hard to give up that 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 type of profit sometimes. I myself and Simos two years ago. We were closing on a property. We were two months away from closing on a property. Somebody gave us an, an offer just before closing to do an assignment. We saw an increase of $113,000. And that was the actual offer that was given to us. We were going to make $113,000, okay? Very, very close to doing it. Like we had to go to the bar. We had a shot of tequila to calm the nerves down a little bit. We looked at each other and we said, ah, you know what, what we tell our clients, we got, we got to eat, sleep, breathe this. We can't, we're not going to sell this. We're not going to sell it. Are we, we're so happy that we did it. Two years later, two years later, it's probably worth a little over $225,000 now, 215,000. Plus we have the ability to refinance it. So that's why it's so important to hold on to your property. And we were talking about it earlier as well. And I know we're kind of jumping back and forth. That's what Justin and I do, but if you, when you hold on to your property, you have the ability to refinance it or get a home equity line of credit and still hold on to the asset. I think what we've heard the most in the 15 years we've done this is, ah, oh, I shouldn't have sold that property. Oh, I wish I had it. You know, and it's, it, it, it's why we're hoping that we can get people, more people to say, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I held on to it. I'm glad I invested into an opportunity because uh, uh, I think when you sell, you just lose out on that asset. It's short-term thinking, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But but to come back full circle to the assignment, very important that you have that ability to assign. Because look, you buy something today that's closing even a year from now, let alone three years from now, four years from now. Life happens. Like you know, mm -hmm. things come up. But you might lose a job. You might you, like you might need to leave the country. I don't know. There's so many so many things can come up. At least if you have that security blanket, you know you can flip the paper. Yeah, I have a five year plan, right? Everybody, what's your five year plan? Probably one of my the one saying I don't like because you know who knows what things are going to happen in the next five years. But you know, Jazz made a really good point that has to be in your offer because things can change, right? Like play devil's advocate that everything's going to go to zero. What's your exit strategy? And it goes back to having a plan. Actually, Shannon and I were in a recent situation and it's so funny. So we talked about like deal analysis and getting stuck in the mud, right? It was a piece of land that we found off market through a connection that we had. We had just done a sale on that street and they wanted a certain price for it. And I knew they were going to get an offer privately on it. And Shannon's like, give them 25 more and let's lock it up and let's just sit on it forever. Right. And I was like, what the comps on the street? There's no way. Like, it's not worth that. I'm like, the last sale was this price. And she's like, it's a great piece of dirt backing onto a river. It's the last one in that block. You just set a record price for a sale on that street. We can build if we wanted to live there. We could build with a partner and then sell. We could literally just flip the dirt. There's like three or four different exit strategies, right? On the property. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of a no brainer. Went down, sat down with the seller, did the negotiation, wrote the deal. Same thing. I was like, oh, like we, we overpaid, right? And I'm in the business. Literally a month later, we got offered hundred more than we paid for that property actually a little bit more than that and i said to shannon what are we doing she goes no we're not selling it. she's like it, this is and it's funny because in that area uh, you know covid actually forced a lot of people to go down that but that's the new baseline price i knew that yeah you know what that's probably what's worth now let's not sell but if i had a strategy where i'm like yeah you know what i'm going to take that i'm going to redeploy it into another you know maybe a development partnership or you know an equity project with somebody that has a larger scale that's okay too, right? Because some people don't want tenants. Some people yep. don't ever want to own an actual property and deal with the day-to-day. -day. They want to build a structure. And you know, how do you look at helping somebody develop, say, a six-month plan to establish kind of their direction? Because I feel like a lot of investors are lacking direction with what they want to do. 
Yeah, look, I mean, what we do, I, and I think we do very well at it, which is sitting down with people and having a 20 minute, you know, in today's day and age of virtual coffee, and really trying to find out what they want to accomplish long term. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer than 20, 20 minutes, but we're trying to figure out, okay, what are you, what are you wanting to, to accomplish long term? What like are you where are you working? Okay, are you okay to deal with tenants and toilets? What are you looking for? Do you want something very like do you want something very passive where like pre-construction condo investing is a passive investment mm -hmm. just in its nature, but there's still more passive investments where you have you never will own a unit. You can do a, a mortgage investment. Some people want to get their hands dirty and they want to do burrs and, and flips and, and they're very inclined to actually do the renovations themselves. And they so want to smash that kitchen, right? Just like everybody on HGTV. 100, well, it looks good on HGTV because it's done in 22 minutes, right? And so I understand that. Um, but but where it starts for, uh, where it starts with us is really sitting down and getting a good idea of what somebody's trying to accomplish. Um, sometimes, as I mentioned, it takes longer than 20 minutes because people come into us and they meet with us thinking, I do want to smash the kitchen. And then when you actually sit down with them, it's like, you know what? I just want to create some generational wealth. I got three kids. I got a kid. I just want to create some generational wealth. Well, okay, if you want to do that, there's a lot of there's a lot of easier ways to do that than trying to get your hands dirty, um, in, especially if you're someone that is not inclined to do that. Like there's shelves behind me here. Like my co-host Laura put this up. I couldn't put mm -hmm. these things up. Everyone knows don't give jazz a hammer. That's not going to work well for us. Right. And so I am a very lazy investor. In fact, Justin, like I, it's why I'm only building and creating my wealth within the pre-construction realm. Why? Because of those options I spoke about. I, I put a down, a down payment, like a deposit over you know, three years, two years, whatever, how long the agreement price to the delivery date price is going to be, our delivery date is going to be of the project, but I also don't need to get a mortgage. I can get very flexible on how I'm going to close. We were touching on, if you're not able to close from a, a financing perspective, there's an option that not a lot of people look at and that we try to help as much as, as many times as we possibly can is actually putting people together to do a joint venture. So how does that work? Let's just say you, you purchase something today, you're closing on it in two years, come two years, like in two years now, you're not able to get the financing for whatever reason, but you've already put the deposits down. You don't want to assign it because you actually want to hold on to the property. Well, like something that we can do is you can bring in a joint venture partner just to get the financing. I can, I probably have a lineup of 50 people right now, okay, like on speed dial, that would get the financing for an investor for 25% equity in the deal. Mm -hmm. Now, from a negotiations perspective, if you have, if you know you're going to have a lineup of 50 people at 25%, maybe offer 10, see where you can go. You know what I mean? Like, you might want to do 50, 50. There's a thousand ways to do a joint venture. You need to look at what's going to work best. What's the demand, but it all, it doesn't have to come down to always assigning the unit because you can't close on it. And giving up a little bit to be able to close and keep that property ultimately could make you a lot more money than just saying, no, you know what? I'm just going to sign it. I want to make hundred percent of the 50,000 I'm going to make on this deal versus you keep it for a couple of years. It's worth 200 and maybe double that. Right. So people just, again, short-term thinking versus long-term growth. Right. I, I mean, even Simeon and I, I mean, we, we, we're now, I think we have three condos that are just joint ventures. Maybe, maybe we're at two or three and he just walked in. I was just looking at him. Um, I think there's about two or three condos where we're 33% owners of it. It's better than having nothing. I'm putting in only 33% of the money. My, I don't have to get all the financing on my own. We're, we're moving it around with my brothers. I have two older brothers, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And so there's six of us with our partners. And so we like how we get the financing is different every single time. You build a trust agreement in the back end with the lawyer. This way, Seamus, if he wants to sell it on his own, he can't do that without my signature. My brothers are not able to, to just refinance a property without me knowing it. There's a lot of protection in place. You just got to kind of see the forest for the trees and, and, and not get bogged down with how am I going to close on it. There's so many options. Dude, people overcomplicate everything, right? Like you and I know some monsters that do some pretty crazy things. 
some of their agreements are almost the most straight up simple agreements you'd have. They're just doing it at a much higher level. CMOS, I wouldn't be too worried about. I know previous to him opening the sushi restaurant, I might be concerned that he'd sell a property on you so he can go for sushi, but I think he's okay now, right? About, I'm a little worried about him taking my money uh, on a regular basis. No, he's good people. Anybody that uh, should check out CMOS's podcast too. He's got the broker playbook. He's super talented. If you're an agent, you're an agent it's a no brainer. Like what yeah. are you uh, watching and listening? Yeah, actually, one of his partners was in my office the other day. We were talking about how amazing that sushi spot is. So I'm excited for when the world opens up and we can all collaborate and kind of get into that. So let's jump back into the pre-construction portion of it. So, you know, JV partnerships. The other thing I want to touch on with that. So, you know, hey, Jazz, I'm Justin Conoco. I want to look at pre-construction opportunities. We've walked through first, like, you know, how you look at a project location. We touched on that a little bit. We talked about, you know, the assignment possibility. We talked about you know, how do you actually close? Like, do you go get a conventional mortgage? Do you assign the sale? Do you do a joint venture? One thing I want you to expand on a little bit is on the joint venture side, talk about relationships, really creating opportunities for wealth. Do you find that, you know, the people that you're doing joint ventures with, with become such a part of your community and your tribe that you're pushing each other to do more things, right? Like you're obviously going to be selective about who you partner with, but then those people are going to give you the gears and, you know, push you to be better and grow and find other opportunities. Then they bring people in that they know and networks will layer on networks and that compounds to incredible changes in your life. Look, look I mean, th there's a reason that the super uber, uber, uber wealthy and successful people say that your, your net worth will always be determined by your network. I mean, you and I met six years ago, seven years ago from a phone call, right? And and we were a little even unsure and more on your end, you were unsure of the, 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 the call that I was making out to you and look what we've created now, right? Um, we, we, we not only have very similar audiences, but we refer business back and forth to each other all the time. Like I, mm -hmm. you know, I was on a call two days ago and you don't even know about it yet, Justin, but Tyler's going to be uh, uh, making an introduction over to you. Like the client's talking like, Jazz, we got three places in the GTA already. We, what is, what is another area where we can see some uh, uh, uptick in value, get that mm -hmm. Delta, get that increase. Sure. I said, you got to go speak to Justin, go talk with Justin. JV partners, they look, I don't think, you know, if you send out an email to somebody and say, let's be a JV partner, or, or you just start cold calling people or knocking on doors. I don't think that's the way to do it. You build the relationship first, you then show credibility, you then take the relationship to the next level. And how do you do that? You, you show some opportunities to them. You say, hey, look, I've been able to do this. Here's my network. Here's my expert all-star real, like my real estate all-star team. It's what it's who I've put together. And so to answer your question, I mean, it's a no-brainer to start building relationships for, for possible joint ventures. Now, understand what you're getting yourself into, mm -hmm. meaning that sometimes a JV might consist of 10 people. And if you're okay with that and you really want something passive, then that might be okay for you. And for somebody else who's watching right now, it might be, well, you know what? I don't like the fact that there's too many cooks in the kitchen and how are we going to make decisions? And so it might be easier to do it with just you and someone else. So two people, or there's times in my life, in my life where I'm like, you know what? If I can't do it on my own, I'm not going to do this one with a partner. I want to do it on my own, or I'm just going to sit back. I don't want too many cooks in the kitchen with me. So I think it all depends on where you are in your life. It's a no brainer to look at it for sure. You can scale, you can scale not only businesses, you, your, your, your portfolio, you need people to do that, right? However, I want you to make sure that you understand what you're getting yourself into. Sit down with people who have done it, ask questions, get in touch with the lawyer. I mean, you can speak to any one of us and we'll put you in touch with lawyers that have done this thousands upon thousands of times. I just like, I just want to make sure everybody understands what they're getting themselves into when you are doing joint ventures, because you're not the only decision maker now. For sure. And I think that's a big misnomer in the industry. I mean, you and I are, we have a lot of conversations behind closed doors on growth and expanding and sharing, you know networks and opinions and i'll call you for cosigns sometimes right and say hey what do you think about this person are they legit and you know some of the people that get into certain aspects of real estate investing they'll just fall forward into it because they're like oh, that's what everybody's doing but you know joint venture is my opinion on it too just to give a quick touch point on it i've had joint ventures you know approach me with things that i just i'm not interested in doing or people that i'm not interested in doing business with 
because you know their values their ethics don't line up with where i'm going you know maybe the way that they handle their tenants or the way that you know they're looking to grow and and develop their portfolio is not what i want to do and that's totally okay it goes back to what we said at the beginning right about just making sure that you're sitting down and having a plan as to what you want to do you want to create generational wealth great how are you going to do it you want to do pre-constructions okay what are my options within pre-constructions one thing you can do with jvs that we've done and it has worked incredibly well is getting into business with people that are doing things you want to do and have done it right so if you want to get into pre-construction condominiums or maybe talk to somebody that's done a couple or jv with somebody that is doing them on a regular basis and then you know build up your portfolio how you want to build it up and then you can go on to the next thing are you super interested in doing burrs we'll call investor girl brick do a jv with her if you can and learn from her right like the people that are doing it at a very high level, I mean, there's some of the most beautiful people in the world and they'll share with you and expand and expand your skill set by showing you the mistakes that they've made, right? And that, that's really where I think the gold is with the JV. What I've noticed as well, especially in the last, say, five years, that the world of real estate in Canada is so small, right? We all kind of know each other. Um, you can ask, a, you know, investor girl Brit about jazz or you can ask uh, uh, jazz about uh, uh, Andrew Hines or, or, or pro funds, Carmen. And like, we, we all know each other. You know what I mean? Like we all kind of know each other. We know each other's reputations. It's why we, we've done joint ventures together, right? We've done collaborations together. And so you just need to ask around. You're going to start to find out for anybody who's watching or listening right now that the world in real estate, specifically in Canada is quite small. So I'm going to jump into a topic. I, one thing I'll note for anybody that's watching this, you guys have an event right after this, don't you? What is that, like 1030? Yes, we start at 1030. We do a, a, a brunch every other Saturday. Um, and so I appreciate you giving the shout out, brother. Um, yeah. yeah. We, start at, we start at 1030. So I kind of think I have a hard stop at like 1020. Um, so I'm good to go. Um, but it's a brunch with REC.com. And what are you guys talking about today? What are we talking about today? That's a good question. Usually Simeon and I just go um, off the cuff. Uh, yeah. but we have Lisa a, we Patel, have a, is she on this week? Like yes, from Trev? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah. I was just looking at my whiteboard on my schedule. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, Lisa Patel, who is the president of the Toronto Real Estate Board. Oh, and wow. we figured, look, I mean, who's better uh, uh, than, than her? I don't know anyone better than her to come on right now and talk about what's happening in the greater Toronto area from a statistical perspective. Super interesting. I wanted to push everybody there after this. I'm going to start hammering your brain and I'm just going to start picking it apart with the burning questions that I have for pre-construction. Go, buddy. Uh, I'm best so, at rapid fire. Throw them at me. Yeah, no, you're all good. So I know one question that's already in the Q&A. It was one that I wanted to cover because it gets overlooked by so many people when they're buying something pre-construction as an investment. And that's around the HST implications, right? I mean, we've had how many calls about this recently where, you know, investors come in, they buy something. You know, the very first thing they need to realize is, am I living in it or am I not living in it? Well, if I'm not living in it and I'm buying as an investment, in quite a lot of times, the builders already built in the HST into the purchase price, assuming they're going to get a rebate. So let's just start there, super high level. Why would a builder build the HST in to the purchase price? Well, it's more attractive, right? Instead of saying like it's uh, uh, it's a four, $400,000 purchase plus HST, which is 13% in our province. So what they do is they build it in, but they're going to get a rebate. As an investor, as an investor, come closing you're going to pay the HST, but it's a weird formula. So stick with me. It's not, I was going to have you walk them through the entire formula. I'm going to walk, <laughs> I'm going to walk people through. I've had thousands upon thousands of these conversations just in the last six months alone. Amazing. So as an investor come closing, you're going to pay the HST on your, on your $400,000 home or condo, but not at 13%. It works out to be 7.2 to 7.3% to a max of $24,000. So you're going to pay the 24,000. Let's just say it's going to be if it's if the purchase price is above 450,000, then you, what you do is you pay this $24,000 HST fee at closing. Is it 24k or is it 24k plus 
No, it's just twenty four thousand dollars. People talk about taxes; they're coming for us. So I want to make sure we got it all covered. Yeah. So twenty four thousand dollars. You can confirm on my purchase price. I was gonna say you can confirm this with a real estate lawyer. Uh, yeah. uh, reach out to any one of us. We have lawyers that have been doing this for years upon years. Okay. Insert disclaimer here. Insert, that, that was my disclaimer, buddy. Um, for sure. You paid twenty four thousand dollars. Okay. On closing. As long as you're renting this property out, providing housing, okay, you you attach your lease agreement, it needs to be minimum for one year, the lease agreement. You send in the form to CRA with your lease agreement. It takes about six to eight weeks to get back the 24,000 and to be exact, it's not 24,000 that you get back. It's like 23,000 and change. So for argument's sake, say why, it's 23. Why is that though? If I had to pay tax, why is the government going to give me $23,000 back on my purchase? So that, yeah. So as long as you're an investor and you're providing housing. Ah, uh -huh, the there's the trick. That's what I wanted you to say. Providing okay. housing. That's why it needs to be a one-year lease agreement. So it mm -hmm. can't be a short-term rental. It can't be for six months. It can't be for three months. It needs to be a one-year lease agreement. But wait, landlords are just opportunistic people that are trying to take advantage of everybody, Jazz. Why would yeah. that be? Why would they incentivize people to provide housing? Well, that three three point five million people that we have coming into the Greater Toronto area, we need a lot of housing, and the city of Toronto specifically is not going to be able to keep up with the demand. So people who are providing housing, they get this rebate back. It's a it's a massive benefit. But I I want everyone to be aware that you need to have that twenty four thousand dollars at closing. There mm -hmm. is companies, and we can put you in touch with anyone. And Justin, you can just send me an email or send Tyler an email. He'll give you the resource. There's a couple, there's, I think, like five, six. We work with two specifically because we've had really good feedback from for ourselves personally as well as clients. They'll actually lend you the $24,000 at closing. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you run into some financial hardship at closing, they'll, this, this company, two of them, will lend you the $24,000 at a cost of $1,400. Plus HST, no pun intended. So, I mean, truthfully, you're like, you can call it on the conservative side, 2,400 minus 1,400. You're still getting a large segment of that money back, right? Yes. And you're knocking it off the price by providing housing for the year. I, I think that's, you know, if you can do that every single time because you're, you're saving that HST cost, right? Now, be careful. If you, if you said to the government that you are renting this out, and you put a one-year lease agreement in place, but if you flipped it within a year, just like anything else, if they come back, like you, they can come back. 364 days, right? I mean, it's exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So just be careful of that, of, of, of your intentions, know what you're doing. Now, going back to kind of an earlier conversation about the assignment, it's one of the reasons why people do an assignment as well, right? Because they don't want to pay those closing costs, including mm -hmm. the HST. To me, the HST is not a big deal because you're getting it back. You got to wait six to eight weeks. It's probably closer to four to six, believe it or not. But let's just say it's six to eight weeks. But that's one of the, the other reasons why people like to uh, uh, do an assignment because they don't want to pay those closing costs. If you do an assignment, understand that the new purchaser has to pay the HST on, on, on the purchase. But when you do the assignment, there's actually HST applicable to the profit that you made. So if you buy something for $400,000 and you're selling it for $500,000 as an assignment before closing, you as the assignor are paying 13% now on that $100,000. And capital gains? Yes. Depends. This is where I want people to go speak it's to their Massive accountant. disclaimer. Get a really good accountant. This a really is like, good like lawyer. the graphics in here. Like, yeah. yeah. Job, yeah, and again, right, this down. is why we're talking about, you know, so say you, I sold a unit to somebody at 350000 It's now worth $425,000. I'm going to sell it. I'm getting seventy five grand. Yeah, you are, but you, you got to really look at your net net, right? Like people, I mean, how many people pitch you and say, I made, how many agents say I made this much in gross commissions this year? What was your net, right? Like how have you planned well, out your yeah, executions? Yeah. A hundred percent, just like, like just, just bringing it back to investors, back to investors. Like when they say, yeah, I made a hundred grand or my, you know what I think I hear more about? I hear that my cousin, my uncle, they did a flip. They made a hundred thousand dollars. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's awesome. And how long did they do that? In? Eight months. Oh, wow. Hmm. That actually is really good. Um, so a hundred thousand dollars came into their bank account. 
No, no, no. I think it was a hundred thousand like that. He bought it for exactly the, the, the example they used 400 to 500. I'm like, okay, so can we just start to calculate the real estate fees on that? The taxes on that? What was the closing Affairs. cost? On it? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? You, you start to start to br- like cut down all those expenses. It's not a hundred thousand. And if you just kept, if you just held on to the real estate, you're going to make a lot more. Yeah. And I think that's one of the main things I wanted to point out with the pre-construction opportunities are you're getting into something early, right? You're getting first access to something that you believe in, you know, as a solid product. I want to talk about the vetting process in a second here as to how you vet a pre-construction project because they're a dime a dozen, just like real estate agents. How do you find the good ones? Um, but you know, that's where you're, you're banking on making your money. And I love the, your quote that I hear over and over is it's boring, right? It's like watching grass grow, but the longer you can watch the grass grow, ultimately the better off you are. Now let's circle back. How do you find the good products? So first and foremost, um, look, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the biggest, biggest, the number one point is location. Can't pick up the building and move it, mm-hmm. period. We need to look at who's going to be our tenants as an investor. So location is number one. Number two is the builder. Who's building this? What's their reputation? Is it their first time at the rodeo? Because we don't want to be the guinea pigs as the investors. So we want to make sure that they've built something and they've built other projects and units or townhomes, whatever the project is. They've done it in the past. So we can touch, see it and smell it. We know what the reputation is. And so builder is very important. Let's make sure that uh, that checks off location. So first. I, I'm going to stop you there because to me, that's yeah. one of the most critical ones. How do you vet a builder? Like what, what do you look for that would give you confidence that they're solid? A couple of things. A, find out, um, uh, find out other purchasers that in, uh, have, have, have bought something that they've built before. Start asking a lot of questions. Get, so let's see what they've done before. Go see it. Go actually drive to the place. Ask the realtor. Say, hey, did this builder build uh, something else? Yes, they built 123 Main Street, 124 Main Street, 126 Main Street. Great. Let's go see it. Touch it. See it. Smell it. Look at the fits. Look at the finishes, right? Go to Tarion's website. Very easy. It's open to the public. It's for the public. Go to Tarion Home Warranty. Google it. I don't know the website off the top of my head. Tarion Home Warranty in Ontario. Search the builder's name. See what comes up. Don't look for the there's nails popping. They haven't got to fix it yet. Stuff. That's silly. Like that's small little stuff. You're Mm -hmm. looking at, Oh, looking like I've seen in the past before there was a leak within the uh, uh, one year period and the builder still didn't fix it. Well, that's a big problem now. Like like, they're not sticking by their word. Right. And so I think the easiest is ask around just like you would say, Hey, does anybody know a good sushi restaurant? And most people are going to say, go to Kibo. Go check it out. If you're in Toronto, that's the restaurant. Everybody speaks about Kibo. Ask around. Number two is, or number one, it's yes, probably easier. Just go to Ontario on home warranty. And that now you can start to vet out who's a good builder. I, myself, in our organization, we just know. We've been doing this for 15 years, right? You ask me who's a good builder and who's not a good builder. If I haven't heard of them, chances are they're probably newer. Because that's just so rare for something to come across our table where we haven't heard of a builder, right? And so mm-hmm. you're looking for for people with uh, builders with strong reputations, just like anything else. You're purchasing a car. If a new car company comes into our our country, everyone's going to be a little weary before you know. You want to get let, let a couple of years pass. Let's see what happens to the engine. Let's see what happens to the transmission, so on and so forth. Real estate's no different in that sense. Builders are no different in that sense asking for a good movie, asking for a good restaurant, same thing, just ask around and then check Terry on home warranty. For sure, and be conscious of what you're hearing and who you're hearing it from. It goes back to your network and having a good group of people around you that are gonna give you honest advice. They should be able to rattle it off in a second and tell you you know, something tangible about the person, the builder, the process, expectations, and if it lines up with what you're looking to do, then phenomenal, if it doesn't, then move on, right? It goes back to what I said about you being in control from a planning perspective and a risk profile perspective, and then using your team as your sounding board, truthfully, Jazz, like you're a mirror to me, right? Where sometimes I got stuff that I'm working through, things I'm struggling with, again, people that I, I'm looking to get co-signed and I call you and that's where you give me that. But I talk to multiple people in my circle and you know, develop a circle of people that are gonna just give you advice based on what is best for you. And that's one of the hardest things for people to understand is the difference between somebody who's just pitching you a project 
say I blast out a pre-con opportunity to my investor database, which is fairly comprehensive, I'm totally cool if not one person buys them because I think it's such a good opportunity by the time I get it that it's a no brainer. You know, how do you weed out the ones that you're not going to pitch to your people? Because people never see the ones that we don't send them, right? How do you delineate them? Great point. So we get 50 projects at our desk every single year. We get, we, 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 we probably get loud about on an, on an average, about eight, to 10, okay. Eight to 10 of them this year, because of COVID, we probably did about six. I think I'm working on my seventh. Um, uh, sorry, we're going to, we finished off our sixth, and we're probably like, we're done for the year on our end here in the GTA. It's why we're starting to look outside in, into other areas. Actually, I'm going to stop you right there for a quick second, because this will be a great wrap up for the last five minutes. I mean, Value-wise, let's show something that's happening right now. I didn't even really plan on this, but I figured it's worth doing. I want you to talk about Carmen and their development up in Lake Huron. I'll break down the details because this is a prime RAC collaboration. This is a pre-construction opportunity we just launched. So I'll talk to you know how we look at it from a sales marketing perspective, the project. How about how do you look at somebody like that, that, that person and you know their development team? Well, look, I mean, if you ask around about Carmen, her company at Pro Funds, Valor Capital, um, Allen Developments, I mean, you ask around, you're going to get high, high recommendation. Mm -hmm. She's been in the real estate world, and um, I'm trying not to age her, uh, but I'm going to say at least, at least two decades. Um, doesn't look it, uh, but but been in the real estate world for a very long time, okay? If you look at a recent project that they did, actually in the greater Toronto area, um, on, on Lakeshore in, 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 in the Missis Mississauga slash almost uh, poor credit, it was done from start to finish. It was commercial on the on the on the ground level, residential uh, above. Flying colors. It sold within months of it being launched. The reputation is very high with Carmen. She's the CEO, but the mm -hmm. whole company in itself, Valor, as I said, the, uh, as well as Allen Developments, and then Pro Funds, her her company that she's been you know running for over a couple of decades. That's what I'm talking about when it comes to reputation. You wanna make sure that the reputation is very high. We have thousands of investors mm -hmm. collectively, Justin, that have invested into pro fund opportunities as well. And each and every one of them have always come back and reinvested their money. So without even them telling us that it was a good investment or not, if they reinvested it, that's a good indication that they had a very mem like a very good positive experience. But there's still a number three in my due diligence checklist that I really want to make sure I touch on before I got to jump off. Yeah, yeah, for That's sure. Location. I said build a, reputa a reputation. The number third is not that it's not as important as the others, but like, it has to be these three: is incentives. What is being offered to investors? Okay. And the number one incentive you want to look at as an investor when you're investing into new builds is where is it at pricing? Mm -hmm. Is it at first access pricing? Is it in the second launch, third launch, or fourth launch? Why is that important? Mm -hmm. Well, you can understand that you want to always be at the first access because you're going to get the lowest price, but you're also going to get the best selection of units. See, contrary to what a lot of uh, uh, purchasers and investors or public think, the builder doesn't want to sell off a project in one day. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they want to control the supply and demand. So they want to see how many people are coming in in terms of how many reservation forms are coming in, how many, how many units do they have, and they want to increase the prices every allocation. So within the first axis of pricing, to the second allocation, we've seen an increase of $35,000, $40,000. Second to third, another $30,000. That's how, mm -hmm. that's where you saw that, like that's where you see the big jumps happen. So it's very, very critical that when you're looking at a pre-construction, you're not, in, if you as the public walk into a sales office yourself, it's too late. Why? Because the builder has the builder won't open the doors to the public until they go through that allocation. So the first allocation is to a trusted 
broker that they worked with in the past. That's why they're giving you kind of like pre-launch. That's the best, best time to look at a pre-construction. The second time they, the, the, the second allocation, generally speaking, is to 10 to 20 brokers. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is to the 56, 57,000 real estate brokers in the GTA. And in the Southern Ontario, it's probably about 62,000 now in Southern Ontario. So those three launch, those three allocations, the prices increase every single mm -hmm. time. So you need to make sure that you are buying in the absolute first access. And if you do, you will win with this type of investment strategy. Phenomenal. There's your hard stop, Jazz. You can bounce off. Everybody go follow him. He's got to get ready for the brunch. I'll get you guys off soon and I'll walk you through some phased in allocation so you can understand. Thank you, brother. You are a beautiful man and I'm sure we'll do this again. Thank you to you, Justin, and thank you to the whole Prime team. There's so many of you over there. I don't want to miss a name, so I'm going to say to everyone, thank you so much. You guys are awesome, and I love you, Conoco. We'll see you soon, brother. Yes. All right. Hey, Lindsay. Sorry. Okay, let me just share my screen really quick with you guys. I'll give you a tangible execution as to what he was talking about by phased in allocation. So here's the actual development that we were talking about. I don't know if you can see it on my screen. Lindsay, can you see this, the Blue Point Lookout? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. So you can tell the design is pretty special. And that talks to the leadership, right? So when Jazz is picking somebody or we just decide that Prime wants to partner with somebody, they need to fit the profile of what we do and we sell exceptional properties and we stand by our clients and we will die on that sword. So when we tell a client that these people are solid, they're solid. We don't work with just anybody, neither does Jazz and his team. So I, you know, seeing something like this, I got super, super inspired because I just, I love design, I love execution. And when I started going through this project, and seeing how they were built, I mean, unreal. Um, again, I'm not selling you anything. I'm just showing you this process, right? If you want to buy something, you're more than welcome to it. But I'm just showing you how I look at it from a broker perspective or an investor. So this is a development up on the shores of Lake Huron, a little town called Kimlaki. Blue Point's beautiful, some incredible sandy beaches. The COVID cottage craze is a real thing. So this is a project that they put a lot of work into and they were rolling out. And they called us to do the sales and marketing for it because we do a lot of business in that area and we know it like the back of our hand. So to me, this was a no brainer. Um, these are the style of homes that they're building. Let me just go down actually to the location. This is what I was going to tell you guys. Super, super important when you're looking at pre-construction sales. Here's the community. Sorry. So the clubhouse, these are, you know, lakefront homes or sorry, not lakefront. The project is very, very close to the lake. So it's just behind where the lake is. This is the entrance to the project. There's a clubhouse, there's a pool, there's a fitness center. There's everything you could imagine. So, you know, if you can't go to Naples this year, this might be an option for you coming up, but the phased in development is essentially five phases, right? So the beach access is actually right here. The entrance to the development is here. This is phase one, this is phase two, this is phase three, four, and five pretty simple. It's not rocket science. They build the development here. Phase one is this whole section. So they have to build the homes and the clubhouse and the walking trails and the fitness center and the pool in phase one, because if I'm buying in phase one and I'm a consumer, I obviously want access to the things I'm paying for. Now, the way that it works is if you notice, I believe there's 32 units in this first phase. So we block in the actual price increases. So the first 10 units that we sold we had a 10% first mover advantage discount on those units. So essentially, if you're looking at $500,000 units, let's keep it real simple. You're looking at $50,000 off the price. So you can buy one of these units for 450 off the plan, do a $5,000 reservation on it. And it is non-committal. You can you know, take your money back if you don't want to execute on it until you get the actual formal agreement of purchase and sale, which is like six weeks from that original agreement of reservation. And then you get another, let's call it 14 day cooling off period after that. So it's really baked in that you're not feeling pressure that you got to buy something, but you're buying at a $50,000 discount, knowing that once these first 10 sell out, the prices go up. Then we do the next 10 at a 5% first movers advantage. So now we got 20 units, first 10, first 10 at 10%, next 10 at 5% off. So you're still getting 25 grand off the next 10 units. And then the balance of the units jump to full price. So the people that buy from the investment perspective, and let's call it the first 20 units, it's not like they're just, you know, hoping that the market goes up. No, these are the actual prices of the units. The developer, you know, wants to get cracking and they're excited about building it. So they're willing to work with the first 20 investors to get the project going. And then as you do in other phased in growth, 
they're going to adjust the prices accordingly, which as was talking about is very important because the good developers, the people like Domus, the people like Carmen that are doing these things, they understand supplies are going to go up. The market is going to appreciate, you know, they can lock in pricing for all five phases right now, but as they do phased in developments, they're always going to open it up to your insiders first. Let me stop sharing my screen for a second so I can explain that to you. Well, what I mean by insiders is when I get those first 10 units, they go to a private buyer list database. And, you know, talking about jazz earlier, investing in a project like this, I invested in a unit myself. So when I'm pitching it to investors, I'm selling you something that I believe in so much that I would actually invest in a project like this. That's what you want to see. You want to see somebody that's showing you something that they have vetted to the point that they're willing to pull the trigger on an investment or, you know, have somebody in their family or somebody in their close inner circle willing to do that. Well, their insiders list is probably going to be the best way of seeing that. And it doesn't mean that you have to be on an insiders list or you have to pull the trigger every time a project gets pitched. But again, circling right back to the beginning about the community of people around you, as you hear, hear stories a year later, you'd be like, hey, Justin, how did Blue Point go? And I'll tell you if it was good, if it was bad, how it actually worked out. <coughs> I actually did this with a family member of ours at a, the project we did for Domus and I was in his office a week and a half ago. And he was the guy that I was talking about, bought pre-construction at 350. It's now worth easily 425. I could probably sell it for a little bit more than that. He's going to keep it so he can deal with that HST thing that we were speaking to earlier. But, you know, it wasn't like I just called him and he just wrote a check. It was a lot of background work into who's the builder, what's the development, what's the location, what, you know, worst case scenario, if we go through five more lockdowns, what does this project look like in five years? I think that's the most crucial thing when you're looking at pre-construction opportunities is, again, not getting stuck in paralysis by analysis and finding, you know, 99 reasons to do something, one reason not to. It's about understanding what you're trying to accomplish and then how you're going to get there and then working with the team of people that will have your back and not pressure you because not actually talking about the blue point project the first 10 sold out in a week we have another i believe five on the board i think i have three more people coming in next week so it's not even like i'm trying to just sell you units here i'm just showing you how a project actually rolls out and you know the level of vetting you want to do on it if you're looking at these opportunities so definitely appreciate all of you guys coming on this is one of my favorite episodes i actually took a whole pile of notes i learned something every time i do one of these if you guys enjoyed it, please just head over to Jazz's pages, give him some love, feel free to, you know, follow us on the YouTube channel and the Facebook, the Prime Mastermind is where we host all of these on a live basis. We do all the replays on the YouTube channel, the Prime Real Estate Brokerage YouTube channel is where you're going to find all of the real estate related content. If you go to my personal Instagram, we'll always be updating you on all these things as well. You guys are wonderful. I saw so many names in the attendees that... You know, I'm thankful that you guys are here. So feel free to reach out anytime you have any questions. Hopefully you guys got some value. Take care.